Well, welcome everybody. My name is Sean Lydon. I'm the chairman of vascular surgery at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm joined by one of my partners, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, my name is Frank Caputo. Um, I'm one of the vascular surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm also the vascular surgery director of the aortic center here, um, as well as the program director of the vascular surgery training programs. So, We're here to talk today a little about abdominal and thoracic aortic aneurysms and sort of how we look at them when we treat them and how we decide to treat them. So maybe, uh, Dr. Caputo, if you want to talk a little bit about when the aneurysms are in the thoracic aorta in the chest, when do we decide to treat them? And then let's get to then how we treat them. Yeah, sure. So, you know, aneurysms generally are defined by their anatomic borders, right? So when we talk about thoracic aneurysm, we're talking about anything above the diaphragm and probably starting from our standpoint at the left subclavian artery or the artery that supplies the left arm. Um, traditionally, this used to be all performed open surgery through an incision on the side, but um, we now have advanced endovascular techniques or I mean, even just basic endovascular techniques where we're able to actually put a stent in those aneurysms. And the question is, when do we do that? Um, the general consensus right now, according to our SVS, or Society for Vascular Surgery, we fix them just about at five and a half centimeters or 55 millimeters or just about a little bit over two and a half inches. Um, and the reason why we do that is what we know is that once an aneurysm hits five and a half centimeters, um, there is an increased chance of having a aortic emergency. Now, in the thoracic aorta, an aortic emergency can be defined as either a rupture, or that means that the aneurysm blows up like a balloon, or we could talk about a dissection where the aorta starts splitting along um, its layers, uh, much like an onion has layers and an aorta has layers. And when those things start splitting, you can have a thing called an aortic dissection. So when we hit about 55 millimeters, 60 millimeters, you have about a 30% chance per year of that happening. So. And so I like to try and explain to patients, it's sort of like if you had a, a tire with a problem, you don't always have to get a brand new tire. So open surgery, you put a replacement piece of graft in, and this is really relining it from the inside, sort of like putting an inner tube within the tire to get, to get that tire to last a whole lot longer. Uh, I, I would say that you know, we really used to only offer open surgery, and now it's rare that open surgery is needed because of the advances in the minimally invasive devices. Uh, Dr. Caputo, why don't you talk about maybe some of the things that the patients can expect if they were to have a repair in terms of the differences and what type of follow-up they need when we do these minimally invasive uh, repairs or thoracic endovascular aneurysm repairs? Yeah. I mean, so the thing about endovascular is, like Dr. Lyon said, it's literally like going within inside of an end tube. And in order to have that, we have to have good landing zones or good spots in the beginning or end of the, the tube. And so we have to monitor those spots because they're not sutured in by hand. And we monitor them generally in the beginning, a little bit closer together, usually at one month and then one year if everything looks good. And then generally we watch them yearly thereafter. And the reason why we do that is A, aortas change when we have aneurysmal disease because we know the aorta can be diseased its entire length. And B, we just wanna make sure that seal sticks. The other thing that we have to talk about is a lot of times we may have to do adjuncts or additional procedures prior to that stenting. Now, this might be as simple as a little bypass in the neck to increase our landing zone, or it might be something even more where we have to talk to our cardiothoracic colleagues to do something in the chest to give us a landing zone. So it's really a, a customized for every individual patient. And I think one of the things that we've come to realize at the Cleveland Clinic and what makes us so separates apart a little bit is a multidisciplinary approach where we actually do talk to our cardiac colleagues and we try to get the best approach for each individual patient, so. The, the other place we see aneurysms is in, in the abdomen below the kidney arteries or a so-called abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that also traditionally had been treated only with open surgery and it is now probably 80% of cases in the United States are treated by a relining as well or minimally invasive surgery. What are your thoughts Dr. Caputo, when you see a patient of how you decide which way they should be treated and what are some of the unique things in terms of our offerings here for our patients in terms of both what we see on a routine basis and, and, uh, and what we have available? Yeah. So first and foremost, what we have available at the Cleveland Clinic is a very experienced cohort of surgeons who deal with aneurysms on a daily basis, right? So that's number one. Number two is we have the expertise to treat both endovascular and open. 
both complicated endovascular and complicated open. So what that allows us is to offer you the best treatment for the patient, right? So when we talk about aneurysms in the belly, um, or what they call infrarenal, pararenal, where they're near the um, renal arteries or involving the renal arteries, it comes down to anatomy of the aneurysm and it comes down to the physiology of the patient or the morbidity of the patient or how sick the patient is. Nowadays, we are seeing an epidemic of endovascular repairs that are being done in 80% of the patients where they're failing. They're failing short term, they're failing long term. And being at the Cleveland Clinic, we see a lot of these patients being referred to us. And a large part of this is where we are literally, people are trying to fit these devices into anatomy that won't accept them. And so I think the number one thing I do when I look at an aneurysm is what the anatomy of that aneurysm. Is it a good anatomy for an EVAR? And if it is, then we can look at the patient. If the patient is young and healthy, and is it better to get fixed open? I mean, Sean, we talk about this all the time, right? Is it, is it better to get fixed open where we have the durability for decades without having to worry about getting radiation from a CAT scan every year or additional procedures? Or is it better to do an EVAR in these patients? And I think right now the data is sussing out that in a young, healthy patient, even with good anatomy, it's better to undergo an open operation. Um, don't you think? Yeah, and, and the way I try to explain to my patients is that uh, both repairs, if you're chosen appropriately, can work wonderful and have you know, you know, only a 1% chance in your lifetime that you'll need something else done. Both repairs, if not in skilled hands and chosen appropriately, can have an issue. And so I think I always tell patients, some people like to buy cars, some people like to lease cars. Either way, you can get a really nice car. You're either gonna pay cash up front and take all the risks up front and then do great in the long term, or you're gonna pay a little bit over time but be paying forever. Each way, you can have a great car that lasts a long time, or you can have a lemon. And so you really wanna pick a reputable car, a reputable dealer, a reputable surgeon, and you wanna make sure that they're gonna do the right thing. The downside of the minimally invasive repair is that they're gonna get imaging it a month, at one year, and then usually every one to two years for as long as they're alive. With the open surgery, they'll get imaging at a year. They'll generally get imaging every three to five years, and the likelihood of need further surgeries is less. And so, as Dr. Caputo said, so if you're a younger person, taking that a little bit longer recovery on the early side so you have a lot less fall up on the late side tends to make a lot more sense. And, and I think that's where we look at it very simply. How sick are you? and how straightforward is the option. And when it's really straightforward and you're sick, always the minimally invasive repair makes sense. And if you're really young, even if you have good anatomy, the downside is you're gonna to have to come back with a lot more CAT scans and have the risk of always needing that checked on because we can't see inside of you. And with, you know, with that being said, as the anatomy gets more and more complicated, the healthier and healthier you have to be as a person. So. If you have a very complicated aneurysm, you have to, and undergo an open operation, be healthy enough to tolerate that open operation. So luckily we have the ability and the technology here where we have advanced um, devices and trial devices where we're able to address some of these complicated aneurysms minimally invasive. We have um, uh, fenestrated grafts, we have branch grafts, so we're able to to provide that for our patient and those patients that can't necessarily undergo the complicated um, open repair. The one thing I will, you know, the caveat is, and the, you know, I always say caveat and poor is when you do not have great anatomy and people try to use a less than um, successful repair using a standard endovascular device and that leads into problems. I mean, how many failed EVARs do we see here a year? So, you know, at the Cleveland Clinic, we do about 1,300 open aneurysm and endovascular aneurysm repair a year. It's the most in the entire country. And most surgeons may never have to take care of a, a minimally invasive failure. We see one about every seven days. And so the problem is that as more surgeons become less comfortable doing larger open surgeries, they may try and push the limits of what a minimally invasive repair can do. And when they fail, they tend to refer them here. You know, I try and explain to patients, we have a tube on the top, we can reline a tube on the bottom and reline, but then in the middle is where all your intestinal and kidney areas come off, and that's where we have options for very advanced, difficult open surgeries or 
minimally invasive relinings, and that's what a branch endograph is. We're putting branches into those kidney vessels, to those intestinal vessels, to try and still allow us to do it in a minimally invasive fashion. Either way, that takes a lot more expertise, a lot more training, a lot more experience, and, and that's something unique that we've had here for a long time at the Cleveland Clinic. So with that, maybe we'll draw our uh, time to close. We'll recommend that if you can look on our website. We'll have uh, information you can see for more resources, and we'd love to take care of you here at the Cleveland Clinic.